Well, all of us have heard of crazy cults at some point or another. Maybe something in the news, or if you are around Texas during the time of the Branch Davidians, or you've read about Christian scientists, all of us have heard about crazy religious cults and their crazy beliefs. But what you may not recognize is that while cults are very obviously wrong, there is a form of deception and false teaching every believer is susceptible to. The consistent warning of the New Testament to Christians is do not be deceived. And in this passage before us today, I think we get a similar warning. Titus is a book uh, about church order. It's a manual on how God's people are to organize God's church. We've seen previously in chapter 1 that Paul in his introduction laid out kind of a vision for the church as this embassy of the kingdom, a people founded in the faith in Christ, growing together in maturity. We saw last time we were in Titus that he also gives a vision for godly leaders, that a church is to be led by elders who are godly examples who can handle the Bible. But it's that last qualification that really sets up today's message, because Paul's going to say the reason that they've got to be able to handle the scriptures is because they must be able to handle false teaching that can crop up in churches. Paul had started the church in Crete. You'll remember he left some things undone. He sends Titus not only to raise up elders, to raise up leaders, but also to deal with the false teaching that was making its way all throughout the church. Now, the reason I really want you to listen today as we walk through this text is simply this. False beliefs lead to false actions. Every single sinful action that you've ever committed has as its root, at its root, a sinful set of beliefs that's deceiving you. Now, I want to be clear. Believers in the end will not be deceived. Believers are people who persevere and in the end walk in the truth. But day to day, moment by moment, sin in us and sin around us, even as believers, can deceive us and drift us into false teaching. What I want to try to show you from God's word today is the danger of false teaching, how we need to respond to false teaching, and really thinking carefully about why false teaching is such a problem in our world today. The first thing I want you to notice in this text is a profile of false teachers. First thing I want you to notice is a profile of false teachers. Look back at your Bibles in verse 10. It says, for there are many rebellious people full of empty talk and deception, especially those from the circumcision party. Paul is identifying the fact that there are many, many false teachers that have cropped up. Apparently after Paul left, these false teachers began to be led astray, began to propagate their false teaching. He tells that they're, empty, they're full of empty talk and deception. They think they're right. They think they know what they're doing, but they're deceiving people. Their talk has no real substance or meaning to it. It's empty. It's offering something that's not true, not real. He mentions that they're especially from the circumcision party. Now, Paul, different than other letters, doesn't really get into the specifics of the type of false teaching that was going on in Crete, as he does in other places like Ephesians or Colossians. But this reference indicates that probably what was going on is there were teachers coming in and emphasizing a kind of pharisaical legalism. You'll remember false teaching, the kind of false teaching that's most dangerous for you and for me, is not so much a kind of false teaching that outright rejects the gospel. The false teaching that's most dangerous for you and I is a kind of false teaching that either subtracts from the gospel or adds to the gospel. You might want to write that down. False teaching that's most dangerous for you and I is the kind of false teaching that subtracts from the gospel or adds to the gospel. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, they subtract from the gospel. They make Jesus less than he really is. They call him just a, 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 an angelic being or a higher form of humanity. You know, Jesus is fully God and fully human. But there's also a kind of false teaching that seeks to add to the gospel. It's a legalism that says, yeah, 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 believe in Jesus, but you also have to do these things in order to be saved. I think there are many really good Roman Catholics, even some of them who are Christians. But hear me say this, 
Roman Catholics are Christians in spite of their theology. There's a kind of addition that Roman Catholicism teaches where it says, yes, it's faith in Christ, but also the sacraments that you need in order to receive God's grace. Be careful about false teaching that subtracts from the gospel or adds to the gospel. Why? Because this passage tells us this kind of false teaching is destructive. Look at verse 11. He says it's necessary to silence them. They're ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. Apparently, these false teachers had infiltrated much of the churches. This reference to households is probably a reference to the fact that these are churches meeting in homes. I know it's hard for us to conceive of that in this kind of setting where we all come together in this nice, beautiful building. But for, for the, at the beginning of the church, especially the New Testament church, oftentimes they were meeting in homes, gathered together. These false teachers are in these homes, in these churches, upsetting the people, overturning their beliefs. Pa- passage says that they're proliferating in part because they're pursuing money dishonestly. Churches are places where people are often ripe for false teaching because we have a high regard for authority. And somebody with charisma, somebody that has kind of a flashy presentation or a funny approach can deceive people because churches are places where people listen to people share a word of authority. But the other reason this was getting such a hearing in Crete is because of what Paul mentions as a cultural factor. Look at verse 12. Why was it spreading so rapidly? Look at verse 12. One of their very own prophets said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. There's a way to win people over in Crete, right? <laughs> then he adds, this testimony is true. <laughs> now what is Paul saying? He's not saying that every Cretan on the island of Crete was some kind of horrible person. He is trying to say that there were culturally accepted norms of deception and lying and gluttony that made the Cretans particularly vulnerable to false teaching. There were cultural norms that made them particularly vulnerable to someone coming in and extorting money from them, coming in and using deceptive false teaching. There are cultural norms at work in our world today that make us susceptible to false teaching today. Let me give you a quick example. Why does prosperity gospel get such a hearing in America? Because we worship prosperity. And if somebody stands up and says, well, if you send this money in now, you fill out this card now, you pray this prayer of faith, you'll have a Rolls Royce. Boy, that gets a hearing in America because we have a cultural bent to that kind of prosperity. This is what Paul's saying about the churches in Crete. There was a kind of a cultural bent that made them susceptible to being taken advantage of, to have people extorting money from them. But what I really want you to focus on is the effect. Look back at verse 11. He says it is necessary to silence them. They are ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't. That word ruining means to overturn something. To turn something upside down and shake it around. The reason false teaching is so dangerous is because it offers false hope. False teaching lifts up a false savior that cannot deliver you from your sins. The problem with subtracting from the gospel is you have a Jesus who can't pull you out of your problems. When you subtract from the gospel, you have a Jesus who is powerless to really deliver you. In the reverse, if you add to the gospel, all of it's riding on you. If your works are what saves you, you're the one in the driver's seat. You're the one that has to pull yourself out of your problems. And Paul says, whether you subtract or add to the gospel, whatever kind of false teaching you give yourself over to, it leaves you without hope because it cannot deliver. Church family, what we've got to recognize is that false teaching and deception is a real threat to us and to every single church that names the name of Jesus. To give you that in a principle, I want you to write this down. Deception is a danger for every church. Deception is a danger, is a real and present threat for every single follower of Christ. 
because of our cultural propensities, because of the sinfulness around us, we have to recognize that this is real. The last two years, one of the conversations that we've had a lot about in our culture is immunity. Getting immunity from COVID, getting immunity from this or that. Is it a shot? You have to get it first. There's all these swirling around discussions about that. And while I do not intend to weigh in on that subject this morning, I do want to make this principle clear. It's dangerous to think you're immune from something that you're not. It's dangerous to think, I'm protected from this when you're not. It's equally dangerous for the church of Jesus Christ to think, I'm immune from false teaching. It's never going to affect me. It's never going to bother me. I could never be deceived, all the while that threat is real and present and before us. Let me tell you why that's so important for me as your pastor. Is I think one of the reasons why we're so often focused on cultural deception and not our own deception is because we fail to recognize we can be deceived. I know many of you heard or watched or read about that performance at the Grammys this past week. And from all indications, it looked incredibly disturbing. We are seeing a moral and cultural degeneration before our very eyes. It's true, it's real, it's happening. We should lament it, we should grieve it. But let me be clear, your first priority is not political or cultural wars. Our first priority must be the purity and the holiness of our church family. Are we an embassy of the kingdom? Are we a foretaste of heaven through our community and our confession? Is there a sense that when people enter our fellowship, they're like, man, this is what heaven's going to be like. It is so easy to get so fired up about what's going on out there that we miss careful watchfulness about what's going on in here. Church family, we have got to be careful that we are not so focused on what's going on out there that we're not carefully watching our teaching, our beliefs, our doctrine. Let me give you an example. For years, Baptist churches have added hundreds if not thousands of people to their roles as members who they have no idea where they are. We are in that situation now as a church. We've got over 3,000 members typically have six to 700 people here on a Sunday morning. That's a big gap. Now, that's what everybody did. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not trying to accuse anybody, but let's face the facts. What we've done is we've said to thousands of people in this community and beyond that you're a Christian, but we have no idea if your life matches up to that. What are we saying? We're saying that you can fill out a card, you can pray a prayer, it doesn't matter how you live. We may very well be giving some people in this community false assurance about their salvation. Because they think that because they're on our roles, they're on heaven's roles. And that's not necessarily the case. Do you see why that's important? Do you see why tending to our own house must be a first priority before we're lobbing grenades at the culture? I'm not saying we don't need to see false teaching in the culture. But church family, our posture as a first importance should be our own church family every church can be deceived it's a real danger and it's one we need to watch but what should we do second thing i want to say about this passage is we see a response to false teachers first thing is we see the profile of false teachers they're leading people astray they're subtracting they're adding there's a motive there's an effect but there's a response this passage clearly calls us to I want you to watch the context of uh, Titus 1, 10 through 16 in light of chapter 1, verse 9. Skip back up in your Bibles to chapter 1, verse 9. Okay? The last qualification for an elder. What is it? Look at it with me. Holding to the faithful message as taught so that he, that's the elder, will be able both to encourage with sound teaching And to refute those who contradict it. So watch this. Titus 1, 10 through 16 is a call not just for Titus to deal with false teaching. But it's a call for the elders to deal with false teaching. 
the elder qualification in verse 9, that they can handle the Bible, that they can see false teaching and correct it, is the direct thing coming before this condemnation of false teaching. What does that mean? False teaching is everybody's job in a church, but there is a sense in which elders, spiritual shepherds, have a particular responsibility to deal with it. They're to do, as it were, the heavy lifting of addressing false teaching in the body. So we're to read the responses Timothy Titus is given to false teaching as responsibilities, not just for Titus, not just for church members in general, but especially for elders, for pastors who are shepherding the body. What are the two things an elder pastor is to do in response to false teaching? Look at with me there in verse 13. Number one, for this reason, rebuke them sharply. He said in verse 11, it's necessary to silence them. The way false teaching must be addressed is head on. It's not a sneak attack. It's not quietly hoping to make suggestions, hoping somebody figures it out. You're to meet it head on. And the language here is intense. It's the picture of silencing somebody, shutting them down. When I think about shutting down, I get the picture in my head. Maybe it's because it's football day, but... I think about Deion Sanders. You guys remember Deion? Cornerback. Quarterbacks literally would not throw to that side of the field because he was so good at shutting down an opposing wide receiver. He would take their best player out of the game because he would just shut them down. That's the picture here, that you're shutting down, taking false teaching out of the picture by correcting it. But not just correcting it. Look at the rest of the verse. Rebuke them sharply. Here's a purpose clause, so that for the purpose of them being sound in the faith and may not pay attention to Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. They're not called just to correct false teaching. They're called to redirect false teaching to the truth. In other words, they're not just spiking the ball in somebody's face. They're not just going, you're wrong and I'm right. They're calling somebody to see their error and to embrace the truth. They're calling them to give up adding or subtracting to the gospel and to believe what's right. He mentions here specifically turning away from Jewish myths and the commands of people who reject the truth. This is probably, and again, an allusion to the fact that these were Jewish false teachers adding to the gospel. Taking their own beliefs about the Old Testament and creating their own commands. You remember Jesus himself dealt with that in his ministry when he said, you're taking the doctrines of humans, you're taking human commands and violating God's commands. Titus is being told similarly, the elders of the church should deal with this directly. Keep your finger in Titus 1. I want to show you an example of this in Galatians 2. Flip over really quick to Galatians 2 because I want you to see this with me. What does this look like? Does Paul ever give us an example of confronting false teaching in the church? I'm so glad you asked that. Galatians 2, 11 through 14. Keep your finger in Titus. Flip over to Galatians because I want you to see this with me. Now Cephas is another name for who? Peter. And so look at how Paul addresses Peter in the book of Galatians here. But when Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. There's that reference again. Then the rest of the Jews joined his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you who are a Jew live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Wouldn't you love to have a friend like Paul call you out in front of everybody? The reason he called him out publicly is because his sin was having a public effect. What was happening here? They were adding to the gospel. 
You can believe in Jesus, but you also got to keep the food laws and circumcision and the purity laws from the Old Testament. You got to do all that. And if you don't do that, we're not going to hang out with you. Could that happen today, Spencer, in our church? Absolutely. Yeah, you got to believe in Jesus, but you also got to check these boxes politically. You also got to check these boxes socioeconomically. You also got to check these boxes in terms of your rage about the culture. And if you don't, I'm not going to associate with you. Paul is saying, both in his command to Titus and his example in Galatians, you have to deal with this stuff head on. Because if you don't, if you let false teaching seep its way into a church, it can create a bunch of Pharisees. You want to know what can hurt our witness more than anything else in this community? Legalistic Phariseeism that makes us look down on everybody else in this community. You know what else could hurt our witness in this community? Subtracting from the gospel that says you can live your life however you want. It doesn't matter. If you've got Jesus, you can sin and do whatever you want. That kind of bad theology makes its way out into a witness that hurts the body of Christ in a community. Here's the point. I want you to write this down. Spiritual leaders must address spiritual deception. They can't ignore it. They can't act like it's not there. They can't worry about who they're going to offend. They've got to deal with it. I think they should be gracious. I think they should be kind. I think they should be loving. I think they should be gentle. But they've got to be resolute in their addressing of spiritual deception. One of the ways elders are called to do that is publicly. There are times when publicly we are going to need to deal with false teaching in our church. Spencer, can you give me an example of when you've tried to do that in your first five years here? Yes. Uh, how many of you remember when I preached a sermon on vaccines? Raise your hand when you remember the sermon I, I preached and went where angels feared to tread. And what I didn't do was get up here and act like I was a medical professional. I didn't say, you should do this. What I said was, we're not going to divide over this issue. And some of you have very strong opinions on one end of the spectrum. Some of you have really strong opinions on the other end of the spectrum. Our unity is not around our medical decisions we're making. Our unity is around the gospel. That's right. Our unity is in our confession of faith. The Baptist Faith and Message. Did you know that the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 does not have a statement on vaccines? <laughs> it doesn't. I checked this morning. <laughs> and the point is, if we add to the gospel and say, well, you've got to do that in order for us to be unified, we're diluting the gospel. We've got to address that. But we don't just do that publicly. We also do that privately with one another. We address false teaching and deception in one another's lives. Individually, yes, I hope that happens through an elder, but I hope that happens through a godly friend that has, can we put it this way, permission to speak freely into your life. Do you have a friend like that? Do you have a godly Christian friend in this community of faith that is the church who can speak freely about what they see in your life? Deception they see. I've told you guys before the phrase that helps me. Mentor in my life, when he's got something hard to say to me, he says, Spencer, would you consider this? And whenever he says, consider this, I kind of get my, ch my, my, my gut gets a little tight because I know I'm about to hear something hard. But do you have a friend like that in your life? One of the ways we guard against the danger of deception is by making sure our church has elders in place who are like antibodies when it comes to dealing with false teaching. They're there to respond to it. But also that the congregation is seated with members, with Christians who love one another enough to say, hey, I see you doing this. Hey, I see you doing that. Have you considered that, that you're bowing down to that idol? Have you considered that there's some false teaching that's seeping into your mind and your heart? If we're going to take the danger of false teaching seriously, we get to have a church that wants to lovingly care for one another in that way. Final question this passage deals with, though, is very simply, why? Thirdly, I want you to write this down. We see the reason for false teachers. We see the reason for false teachers. Paul moves in verse 15 to give us a principle. He moves from the particular situation in Crete to kind of zoom out and give a principial category of how we are to understand 
false teaching. Look what he says in verse 15. Look at him zooming out and giving a principle. He says, to the pure, everything is pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. What he's saying is, only Jesus can cleanse and purify us. Only the blood and the power of Jesus can lift the scales from our eyes to see what's true. If you have Christ, you see things rightly by his spirit and by his word. If you don't have Christ, everything you see is distorted, it's tainted. He calls it impure. My dad had horrible vision. When I was a kid, every once in a while, I would pick up my dad's glasses and put them on. You ever done that? And I'd kind of like get dizzy and stagger back because I couldn't see. All of us enter the world with the wrong prescription glasses. All of us enter the world with a sinful prescription problem so that we can't see. Why is false teaching so prevalent in our world? Why does it proliferate everywhere? Because sin deceives and distorts. Listen to how he describes this distortion of sin. Listen to this progression in verse 15. Look back at it with me there in your Bibles. He says this impurity. He says, in fact, in verse 15, both their mind and conscience are defiled. They claim to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. Paul says their minds are defiled. They can't see things rightly. They think life's about them. This is why politicians are great at identifying problems. Horrible, horrible at identifying solutions. They can see it. There's a problem. There's a brokenness with the world. But the solutions they appropriate oftentimes make it worse. Why? There's a defilement. There's a conscience that's been warped and twisted by sin. Verse 16, their hearts are twisted and warped. They claim to know God, but they deny him. They actually think they know the living and true God, but their lives reflect a deception. Let me remind you of a very important fact. Sincerity is not a litmus test for truth. Just because somebody is sincere and, oh man, they really feel this and they've got this experience, does not mean it's true. Paul says, be careful. That sinful distortion can make even someone come across very convincingly, very intelligently, very intensely, but it doesn't mean it's true. What's the result? Look at verse 16 again. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. The result is they are unable to do truly good works. Does that mean that non-Christians can't do good deeds? No, of course. Non-Christians can do moral things all the time. It's just done from an immoral heart. And so while it may look like a very outwardly moral thing when they help a little old lady cross the street, their hearts are desperately wicked because they're still serving themselves. Paul says it, it seeps in everywhere. What's clear, according to Paul in verse 15 and 16, is deception does not come just from misunderstandings, doesn't come just from a failure to communicate or miscommunication. Spiritual deception comes from spiritual corruption of humans. That's what verse 15 and 16 are saying very simply. Spiritual corruption breeds spiritual deception. So what do we do? If indeed we're called to see the danger of deception, if indeed we're called to be part of a church where we have elders in place that respond to that, how do we personally day-to-day live our lives in response to this? The word I would use or the phrase I would use to describe, I think, the thrust of this passage is that we need a spiritual vigilance. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Spiritual corruption requires spiritual vigilance. To be vigilant means to be watchful or careful. I think the spirit of this passage is Paul saying, look, this is real. This is a threat. This is a danger. Be aware that this is before you. In the 1920s, our country created the tomb of the unknown soldier. How many of you heard of that tomb? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. In the 30s, they actually began to establish a 24-hour, seven days a week guard around that tomb. It's there to commemorate fallen soldiers whose remains have not come home. Different conflicts across the world that 
People have died. They've not brought their remains back. And that, that tomb is there to symbolize and to give thanks for people who've paid the ultimate sacrifice, but we don't know where they are, where they're, what, what, what happened to them. That guard, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is watchfully, vigilantly guarding what that tomb represents, the truth of it, the honor we're to show it. And what I'm appealing to you as we close this morning is simply this. I think we need a kind of spiritual vigilance, a spiritual watchfulness of our own souls, lest we be deceived. We need a kind of watchfulness in our lives that recognizes I'm not above being deceived. I'm not above drifting into idolatry. I'm not above drifting into false teaching. This is why every single week we take time to confess our sin as a family. Why? Because we're assuming, we're not wondering. We're not saying if, we're saying when deception, when idolatry, when false teaching happens in my life, I need to repent. Spiritual vigilance means that there's a watchfulness of my own soul when it comes to deception. If I'm going to be spiritually vigilant, then I want to encourage you as I close with three strong applications. Three strong admonitions that I hope help us live a kind of spiritual vigilance in our lives. Number one you got to know the truth. You want to be spiritually vigilant? Know the truth. The answer to vigilance is not studying Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Buddhism. Like, it's not knowing all the error. It's knowing the truth so well that you can identify error when it shows up. You need to know the substitutionary work of Jesus. That Jesus died in your place, that he rose again to give you new life. You need to understand your justification in him. That by faith, you trade places with him. He gets your sin and guilt. You get his righteousness. You need to understand that that's an event. That's not a process. Your justification is a moment in time, if you know Christ, when you receive his forgiveness and grace. You need to understand sanctification. That your life... It's a process by which the Spirit of God is conforming your behavior to your declaration in Christ. There is a power at work in you and I that means I don't have to say yes to sin anymore. I don't have to give in to that. I can walk in holiness and Christ-likeness. But you also need to understand your glorification. That one day you're going to be perfected. One day you're going to be made whole. One day all the pain and sorrow that you feel in this life will be gone. My greatest joys as your pastor is getting to walk through this room before the service and just talk to you guys and see how you're doing. I know that there are some of you that are struggling with pain and sorrow and difficulty of all manners. Can I just remind you that there's a day coming when all that's going to be gone. Isn't that good news? There's a day coming when all the pain, all the sorrow is going to be gone. But if I don't understand that my hope is in Christ, I can place my hope in a doctor, in the next pill, in the next appointment, in the next 401k deposit. I can place my hope in all the wrong places if I don't understand the truth. If you're going to be spiritually vigilant, number one, know the truth. Number two, know your soul. Know the state and the condition and the tendencies of your own sinful heart. Tonight, the Chiefs and the Eagles are going to play each other. Go Chiefs. (laughs) That's for our sound guys in the back. Uh, Each of those teams have weaknesses, right? There are certain weaknesses that they have. Their goal from the coaching staff is to make sure their team is not being put in a situation where those weaknesses can be exploited. So if Patrick Mahomes is struggling, throwing down the middle of the field because he's going to get get intercepted, you know what they're going to do? They're not going to throw down the middle of the field. You need to know where your weaknesses are. You need to know your tendencies and try to not put yourself in those kind of situations. Some of you are self-sufficient. You got this. You're pridefully self-reliant. You need to know that. You need to know that tendency of your own heart. Some of us are rebellious by nature. We don't like anybody telling us what to do. Right? 
We need to know the tendency of our heart and not throw the ball down the middle of the field so we get intercepted. Know the state of your soul if you're going to be spiritually vigilant and watchful in your life. Thirdly and finally, invite accountability. Can I just encourage you to what I said a moment ago? Invite someone that has the permission to speak freely, to speak into your life. One of the greatest gifts God has ever given me are friends and mentors who I trust, but who love me to look at me and say, Spencer, I think you're blowing it. Does it hurt? Sure. You think Peter liked being confronted in front of everybody? I don't think it was very fun. But it's necessary. It's necessary. Know the truth. Know your soul. And invite accountability. We, as a church family, want to encourage you not just to know the truth. We don't just want to teach you the truth. We also want to sing the truth. One of the ways we try to reinforce the truthfulness of what we have in Christ is by singing rich, deep, truthful theology. We try to be very careful in every single song that we select to make sure it's not just singable, not just a fun and exciting tune behind it, but it actually teaches something that's important. We're going to sing a new song as we close today called The Ancient of Days, and I pray that it's a blessing to you. It says, though nations raise kingdom, excuse me, though nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is one king reigning over all. So I will not fear, for this truth remains, that my God is the Ancient of Days. None above him, none before him, all of time is in his hands. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days speaks to a fundamental element of God's character and his nature. He's different than you and I in that he is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He is the great I Am. And a minute after we, I pray and we sing, as we sing this song, I pray that God would open your eyes to the danger of deception and ground you anew and afresh in the truth one who loves you. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word you've given us today. And God, I, I feel like you've spoken to us today. That you've given us a warning of the danger of deception. Lord, I pray that today's message is more than just a warning more than just alerting us to a problem, but God, that it would seek us, it would cause us to seek you anew and afresh, that we press deeper into the grace and the mercy you've given us, that we'd invite people into our lives to speak truth, and that we'd be transformed. Father, I pray for anyone here today who does not know you, anyone in this room who's never placed their faith and their trust in you, I pray that they turn from their sin today and trust you and you alone. God, as we turn our attention now to sing the truth, pray that you grant us anew and afresh in who you are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, I forgot to say one thing before I close. If you're not a Christian, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I want you to know we'd love to talk to you about how to become one, how to turn from your sin and trust Christ. As soon as this service is over, we'll have people standing up back there. But I also just want you to know, I'm always down here up front Last week, I had the privilege of leading somebody to Christ right over here after our service. For some of you that want to know more about becoming a Christian and following Jesus, know that we'd love to pray with you and talk with you and answer any questions that you have.